So Dr. Justin Aglio, who's the Senior Director at the Readiness Institute, Institute at Penn State uh, in Pennsylvania, he's formerly of Montour School District. We've met before, and uh, I know he's an awesome guy, and he's going to share with us what's happening over there, and we're going to angle the conversation a little bit around motivation, maybe a little bit of discussion on student agency, what's going on out there, but I want him to just sort of kick it off with an intro. So Justin, you're on. Go on camera, please. So, so how you been? It's been like how long since I've seen you? Like, uh, well, v virtually last summer, I think, and then before that, maybe a while. Yeah, since my trips to California, um, it's been wonderful. It's been exciting to see education kind of twist and bend a little bit and adapting to. I always say we traditionally in education, we've always adopted curriculums and programs and yeah. you know, lesson plans and. Now it's kind of at that stage where we're adapting, right? So we're yeah. adapting to everything, which is totally mind blowing to us, but opening our, I, I call it like our can of strengths, right? We have undiscovered talents that we never had before that we're just conquering, I think right now in education. It's really exciting times, but uh, I'm doing great. How are you? Awesome. You know, we, we had a, a record year. I will tell you, Justin, the reason I asked you about the year is because uh, Doug and I had uh, done a Kansas City event and flew into Philadelphia March 13th or 12th. Um, and while we were in the air, our staff were texting us, no one's going to come tomorrow. So <laughs> and we were so bummed out. We get into Philadelphia and I was really looking forward to going to one of my favorite restaurants there. And oh. <laughs> we, we got we caught a we, we stayed, um, caught a flight out 6 a.m. I wow. went back home. And, and so it was really interesting because Philadelphia was the last place we didn't get to be, right? It was yeah. like, so it's been like two years. Um, so now you're at the Readiness Institute. Take a moment and tell me about that for a second. I don't know about that. Yeah, so I served as a teacher principal for 10 years. That explains my bald haircut there. And yeah. I was a district leader as a curriculum director for six years. And recently I was challenged by the Heinz Endowments of Pittsburgh, the Heinz Foundation, and said, hey, Justin, you know what? We see all these grant applications coming to us for college and career readiness. The fact is, as we're preparing kids to be college and career readiness, all, are they really college ready? Because they're going off to college and the research we see is that kids aren't actually ready for college yet. In fact, they don't even actually graduate in degrees they want to go into and graduate with that. And that's yeah. okay. And that's still important. But are they career ready too? Are they yeah. going to careers and being successful, having those essential skills, modern literacies that need to be successful? So we are talking about at the Heinz Endowments to start what, we, what we're calling the Community and Future Readiness Institute, but we need to, this for, to live at a university. And so we contacted Penn State and university, and they're the only land-granted university within Pennsylvania. They have a strong outreach department. And so we said, hey, let's do this and let's really prepare all students across the whole state to be community and future ready, working with educators, working with industry leaders, working with community leaders, and enabling all those great organizations to help students design and lead a purposeful life. So we're working with school districts, we're running summer programs, essential skill workshops, we're doing projects. In fact, we just, we just launched the Readiness Institute on November 30th of 2020. So right in the middle of the pandemic, we launched this. And one of my colleagues at Penn State, Pam, said, she goes, Justin, here's what I want you to bring to Penn State and across the, the region and across the state and really to the world. I want you to bring hope in 2021. I said, <laughs> that sounds like a big first step in a, you know, in a first in a new job, but we'll do our best. So I reached out to a couple of colleagues and friends of mine, Esther Wojcicki and Astrobotic Space Technologies and and we said, you know what, our first project at the Readiness Institute, we're going to crowdsource hope messages from around the world, and we're going to send them to the moon in 2021. And that's exactly what we did. We crowdsourced thousands of hope messages for free on our website from 37 countries. We downloaded, downloaded them to an SD card. I went to Astrobotic Space Technologies. I dropped them off there. And in the late half of 2021, that SD card with 
all those thousands of hope messages from 37 countries are going to go on the first commercial payload in history to the moon, land on the moon, that SD card. So when people go outside and look at the night sky, when they look at the moon, they know that their hopes are on the moon. If their hopes can reach the moon, then their hopes can become true on earth. So that was the first project we launched. And it was such an important project to me because when people come to the Readiness Institute and we work with school districts, uh, we're an outreach program, everything's free. We could say to them, listen, we could do anything because mm -hmm. we just launched a rocket to the moon. And so um, that's, that's the Readiness cool. Institute. And uh, we're really excited to share what we do. And we just launched and we, we've accomplished so much in such little time. And we're really excited to serve is our passion. Yeah, I can tell. That's super exciting. <laughs> And you're gonna have to send us some uh, press links so we can. I will. We have plenty of those already. And, and um, you know, again, it's just one of those things as a former teacher, principal and curriculum director for a school district. Anytime you get a chance to serve a larger community, you know, you, you want to take advantage of that. And that's why, you know, we, we started the Readiness Institute from scratch, a brand new division at Penn State. Yeah, I love it. Um, so this is really why it's apropos of the whole motivation conversation because of what you've been doing. And really it started with you being motivated to do something about that readiness thing. But now we're living in, like I said earlier, sort of a fractured world. Um, readiness as well as motivation starts with you as an individual feeling a sense of agency, which in my mind, and I, I'm sure a lot of people agree with me on that, student agency was sort of, um, contextualized since we were in a model everywhere for so long that was don't go anywhere until I tell you to now study this don't do anything else don't you're kept hostage right yeah your 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 attention is so confined and directed um you know because that's how we ran people you know like in the industrial age you guys marched in lockstep. You better do that or you're going to be fired. You know, it's like everybody go down into the mines at the same time. Um, so now we're living in a world that is vastly mutated. And one of the things that really comes to attention from me is the seeing that what's being expected now is every student has agency. Yes. And, and maybe not entire, like I'm going to self-direct my way into calculus, you know, um, and I'm going to, I'm going to be so ready for college. Nobody saw me coming, not that level yet on a national scale, but at least a level where you got to get up out of bed, you got to get dressed and presentable. Um, you got to get on screen or you do have to go to the physical school. Um, and you got to know where you got to be at any more time da, 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 da. and you kind of got to make sure that you're checking your notifications and getting everything done and logged in in the right place. <clears throat> this is still a monumental shift in agency. It's not all the way to self-directed homeschooling or whatever, but it's definitely a major shift. And I think that that then takes us down the road of like, why are students not motivated? Well, they don't know they're supposed to be. So, um, you know, because they weren't, they're not inculcated with a sense of I run myself yet. And, it, and uh, I want to talk to you about that from first year experience of the district level and then later. And then I don't know if you wanted to share some slides too and go, take us down other roads, um, willing to do that. But can you answer that first? Yeah, um, absolutely. So I, I would say the first thing when back in March when the world flipped upside down education, right? It's, it's change. Oh my goodness. We have this change that's happening to us. How do we, how do we adapt to this change and so forth? And it made me think real, real quick to the first episode. And I'm actually sitting in Mr. Rogers' living room right now. I know. I love it. Love, yes. love the plaid couch. Woo. Well, the first episode of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, to me, it made me think of that first episode from 1968. In that first episode of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, King yeah. Friday was totally against change, didn't like change and this and that. And when Charlie came back from the land of make-believe, he told Mr. Rogers, hey, King Friday does not like change. Well, Mr. Rogers says, I knew someone that moved his bed from this side of the room to that side of the room. And they woke up the next day. They said, gee, you know what? I've got some new ideas and change is good. So in the first ever episode of Mr. Rogers, he talks about 
how change is good and change leads to new ideas. And here we are right now. We took that message. We embraced it. We said, okay, what are some new ideas? And people say, oh, my goodness, we'll have to rethink how I teach. I have to rethink how I learn. Well, you know, that's a good thing because we need these new ideas because we need to challenge each other. And like I said, unlock that box of my potential, that what you said, agency that we have. And it really made us focus on not so much the tools, but relationships, best practices. You said something, you know, the students are not there held hostage. That's the first thing we said, you know, when we're talking to our teachers, the students are not there where they have to sit in front of you. They have to sit down and listen to you. My dad was a coal miner, like you said, down in the mines. Yeah. He had to go do that, right? So the students can no longer sit there. And now, the, you know, the learning, the, the, the learning is the curtains pulled back. What's happening, right? In the classroom, parents are watching, students are watching. And the conversation went from what am I teaching to now what are the students truly learning and how can I engage them and, and dress up in costumes, you know, as an elementary teacher, open up a whole new world of collaboration tools. If you're a high school teacher for middle school students, sending those notes and postcards home to engage. I have a 14, 11 and eight year old. I can tell you right now that they from motivation wise mm -hmm. are like this. They're like, it's a roller coaster every day. It's like, yeah. I kind of tip them like, Hey, how's school today? Sometimes it's, oh, it's awesome. Sometimes it's a, just a nervous breakdown. They're crying. And, um, but, you well, know, that might just be hormones, right? That could that might, be. Yeah, that might just be being a child. Um, but I know a lot of adults in the same boat. So, you know, we can oh, go. My, my daughter, she, you know, she's 11 years old. She gets a postcard from her teacher and like mm -hmm. it motivates her for the next three weeks. You know, my 14 year old, he gets a, a personal message from his uh, math teacher for a video. Hey, I noticed you did this wrong. Try this. And then he's like, oh my goodness, they actually do care about me. They're taking the time to do it on one, one video. My, my eight year old, um, he goes, he goes on and instead of school that day, they're, they're doing um, some type of uh, craft and activity from your house, like a common maker activity, you know, yeah. to bring it up. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's has been really interesting. Um, you know, at the same time, we, we're learning a lot educators are learning a lot students are learning a lot it's not the same and but we're seeing some great things happening i'm sure across the land and, uh, and that's what we have to have is that healthy mindset and that's why you know we look at what readiness begins with readiness begins with hope you have to have that healthy mindset to move forward and that's one of the things that we constantly preach to our teachers is that a you're never alone b you're yeah. always working with someone yeah and i think um i think technically the world of education could look at even beyond hope right like this is a we are in the land of magic right now and the magicalness even the, the last district that was with us parker when they were sharing some of what their teacher said there's some magic that happened yeah. the teachers grew the students grew people were like into little magic trails of like look what we can do together Woo! it was like the fun level could be celebrated at orders of magnitude greater than it has been rather than, oh, we're locked down, right? Yeah. Like I, really, I honestly want more school districts to go, stop doing that. Like, stop even talking about it. Oh, like, yeah. You know, that, that's one thing we always talk off. about. Celebrate the successes. Yeah. Every day, let's talk about successes. One of the things when we shut down last spring, one of the biggest things we wanted to keep our routines and habits with the teachers and students and school community. So, the principals and I, we did these funny morning uh, um, announcements every day, and we started having guest speakers on. You know, I called Mark Cuban. I said, "Hey, Mark, send me a video to put on tomorrow's morning announcements." You know, I said, "Hey, kids, we got a special message from Mr. Mark Cuban of Shark Tank." And it's like, "Hey, Montour School District, I just want to tell you." Da, 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 da. We started getting so. We have I've to kind of find ways to, to engage things. He's an awesome, yeah, he's such a huge advocate for education. Um, he didn't used to be, which is strange that you say that, because when I first met him, he was like, ah, education. And I was like, oh, wow, <laughs> Mark, you're funny, right? <laughs> Until you get <laughs> so we and you're like, oh, my goodness, this education thing, I don't get it. Um, mm -hmm. No, but, I, you know, so it, 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 I, I worked with a former uh, principal, and he used to always say, uh, our school districts like Disney World, um, he used to always say to parents, welcome to Disney World where dreams come true. And that's, I think that's what we kind of have to talk about magic is really kind of have people say, hey, think outside the box. And, and more than ever, you know, 
you know, I always say like, you don't, you don't need a PhD or a master's degree or this degree or this degree. You just have to do what's best for kids in this time. Use common mm -hmm. sense. You know, if you think this is a great activity as a school administrator, I have, this is the trust level comes in like, Hey, do what you think. Like, stop waiting for me to tell you what to do. That's probably the biggest criticism I have, but I'm a very optimistic guy for, you know, glasses, full, you know, half full and so forth. But my biggest, biggest criticism is when people are sitting on their hands saying, well, I'm waiting to get guidance on what to do next from the next level above me, from the federal government to the state level to the district level, to the school level. I'm just going to sit and wait. Well, you can't sit and wait. That's actually how we got a lot of school districts got into uh, not a very successful model when schools shut down last year because they sat and wait. So a lot of school districts and probably a lot of your people who you had on today said, hey, five years ago, we are doing digital citizenship. Six years ago, we were practicing one-to-one -one technology and best learning management system tools out there. Uh, three years ago, we really did a deep dive on student agency. And so when it came to this point, they were ready. School district like, said, well, you know what? I'm, I'm not going to do that until someone tells me I have to do it. That's where we're seeing a, the, the divide and in inequities in education right now yeah. happening. Yeah. And I find it fascinating. If you step outside education, you just look down like from a 30,000 foot level. You know, the equity conversation will never end. Because what you just said is one district got their act together and the one right next door didn't. So now you've got a state and now the country that has an inequitable map. And it's not because it's not because everybody wants it to be that way. It's because we've got columns of attack, right? Like these guys are different than these guys. Not that we want an autocracy either, but um, you know, we we have a situation. And, and there's this little thing that's starting to happen, like I said, the agency, the sense of self-directedness and the, you know, fuel got poured onto that fire during the early part of the pandemic by the consumer markets, marketing just like gangbusters, you know, like K-12 Incorporated and a lot of these online schools, they just ballooned, like their stock prices just went out the roof homeschooling took off on orders of magnitude and it was, it's just majestic the shift in the actual structure but that little thing of student agency combined with that expectation for high quality ui ux mm -hmm. navigational experience recommendations engine hitting me with here's a calculus problem that you should try here's a this and blah 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 did you want to take a trip in this video to egypt you know there's just there's stuff happening now that I don't think is going to cause just more tech in education. It's going to continue to fracture the map. And so this readiness thing mm -hmm. that you're into is something I'm into at an institutional level. Like you're not ready for the consumerization of this market. You aren't consumerized, you're manufacturing modeled and you need to think about that really deeply because education and history is always eventually mirrored the rest of the industries. And it hasn't so far, like, you know, the tech age came and then the knowledge age came and now we're in the deep into 22nd century yeah. and they're still manufacturing model, whole group. I don't yeah. think that's going to hold. You know, and, uh, um, you, yeah. One, one, one of the, um, when Penn State and Hines said, hey, Justin, you know, what about this Radiance Institute? I remember having a conversation of, you know, our superintendent at the time. And I said, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm thinking about doing this thing. And, and I said, you know, it, it's, you know, when you work at a school district, you know, you work for the school district in Pennsylvania, there's 500 of them. And you talked about the school districts next door to the school districts. And I said, you know, this will give me an opportunity to be that boundary spanner between the different school districts to work with everyone involved, because you do see the inequities between school districts. Yeah. And, so forth. and, and that was one of the reasons why I wanted to jump on board with this and what went when we started, we actually started using what you're talking about. The, we, we started calling it modern literacies. And yeah. because, you know, modern literacies shift over time. And, and if we're preparing some, somebody to be something in 2021, 2023, modern literacies may change. And it's up to us to really define what those modern literacies are. So we see, of our, see ourselves as this test solution for school districts to try these different modern literacies, to do these workshops around these literacies, to go back and then 
you know, have school districts adopt these or we coach them, we work with them to do these things because, you know, you, you look at, you know, modern literacy is like cultural uh, relevance right now. We look at um, even digital literacy. We look at uh, mental uh, awareness. I was uh, part of a team. They were doing virtual instruction as another organization. And they said, boy, one of the things we're really helping kids with virtual instruction is we're giving them time and we're being patient with them. I said, whoa, time out. They're at home. That's why they're having issues right now with maybe drug and alcohol abuse as high school students or because they have too much time and they don't know what to do with it. So giving more time and being more patient actually may hurt them. Let's focus on providing skills when students are at home what they could be doing in order to be healthy and have a healthy lifestyle and a well-balanced lifestyle. So, you know, those are things that are. Well, I'm up. so glad you said that. I'm so glad you brought that up with people because you were so right about that. Yeah, I mean, we can't, I mean, that was the time. That's why the social emotional piece and mental awareness is, you know, we thought it was, you know, kids coming. Well, kids, let's be honest. Kids came to school a lot of times to escape those things, right? They got, they got, a meal yeah. a day, two meals a day. They were nurturing people. They were in an environment. You take that away, holy cow. I mean, just the world's flipped upside down to those kids and, and the things they look forward to getting go, getting in the morning, saying someone hello to them, it's taken away. So let's not give them time and be patient. I think sometimes we need a time and, 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 and we need our patience to, you know, to cope with this, the stress of it. But and that's why it's important for administrators. I mean, I worked for a lot of great school districts and administrators that were really good with this to, you know, not just say to the teachers, hey, we're going to give you time to work through this. No, again, time out. Yeah. Let's, let's meet weekly. Let's share success stories. Let's talk about what's working in your classroom, what's working in your classroom, and let's build upon this and then collaborate. That's again, that's one of the things that I cannot stress during this time. Is if you're if you feel like you're alone, if you have teachers. And, and educators in your school system that are feel like they're left alone, their motivation from them gets sucked out. You need time for them to collaborate virtually, in person, whatever it is, to share best practices, to do what, you know, to get together um, so they feel like they're not left alone. And that, that motivation piece right there helps out a lot. And students are the same way. You know, students, you can't, it can't be business. It can't be go to math, science, social studies, uh, reading and log off for the day. You know, they need time to, uh, my daughter does, her teacher does a real nice job. She gets her homeroom on virtually when they have their virtual days and they just say, Hey, let's just talk. You know, I, I, what's your favorite animals, everyone. And like that, that's the time she looks forward to because that time was taken away from her, but that teacher's bringing it back to them, which was pretty cool. I love that you made that point too, because I've, I've challenged people on some of these regional events. I'm like, what are your teachers really doing online? Are they like being the TV host, yeah. the movie star personality the whole time, or do they just shut up yeah. and they can have the camera on, but their head is down, they're working on something else. And so is everybody else's kid. How about if we have virtual togetherness without having to talk the whole time, right? Can you imagine that? Um, because people don't do that because then they're working and they feel like they're still in the same room with you, but they're not paying attention necessarily unless they have a question. And then they're like, Hey, blah, blah, blah. And then the two of you are talking, other kids can listen in while they're doing it. Camera on or camera off. Some of the States are not allowing cameras at all into the home. Yeah. Florida's told us this because oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, HIPAA, COPA, SERP, you know, yes. uh, blah, 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 real big, re real big reasons. You never want to share the, image of young children illegal as heck so um well, and, there, and, there, and there's stories why that shouldn't be and you know we had a discussion you know last spring should the cameras be on or off and this and that you know if you if you're using a google platform you can look at the camera like i'm looking at you hit one button and freeze my face and i'm gone you know like i could be like this freeze it get up and walk away and it's yeah. like my camera's on, it's the camera's off, but it looks like I'm paying attention. So there's even ways around that. It really yeah. comes down to, instead so of say, make sure the camera's on, make sure the students are logged on, make sure this, how about again, timeout, let's make sure your content is engaging, 
relevant, meaningful, it's mm -hmm. interactive, you're putting students in breakout rooms, you're assigning them projects, you're, you're looking at higher level thinking skills, uh, you know, those are the things that we should be talking about, not the rules. Again, it's almost like finding that, um, the, the uh, formula to hold them hostage online, <laughs> you know? Yeah, it's, how do we do that? that? Mindset. Well, you know what I find really interesting about this is this moment is challenging everything, like everything. Right. Like there's not one part that we're not like looking at going, yeah, why do we do it that way? Um, and if we're not thinking that way as leaders, then we, we probably should have our heads checked because essentially what you just said about, you know, being this online, like I can just check out, you know, a lot of superintendents have told me like the kids are like, we assign them a video and they're going two and three times the speed through it. Why? Cause that's their absorption rate. And before this, we're droning on in front of the classroom and we have one absorption rate in our mind. Everyone absorbs the same. They never did, no. right? They never did. There was always three or four kids in the back of the room who weren't paying attention. They were checking out Susie in the next row. That's and, right. You know, they were, they were never at speed. And then there's always those other kids that were like way ahead of us and they're checked out. They're doing something else. Right. They're like, what's he going to talk about today? Yeah, I got that. Right. So we always, always, always have had a map of humans in the world who were all different. Yeah. There was no all that they're all oranges and one apple over here with a with a special needs pattern. You know, no, everyone is totally different in every subject. Right. Yeah, I'm, I'm so glad you said that. I, I teach graduate course online and, you know, that's er, not every summer, but I give options to my students. Hey, if you want to make a video to capture something in, if you want to uh, write a one page summary on it, if you mm -hmm. want to do this, pick which one you want to do and turn it in. I don't care about how you do it. I care about, you know, what you're learning from it. That's, that's all I care about. And, um, and you see a lot of great teachers doing that. I will say um, Randy Pausch, the author of the last lecture and uh, Carnegie Mellon, um, a former professor, great, great person, um, talked about in uh, the walls, you know, when the brick wall is in front of you, the brick wall is in front of you, not to stop you from going, it's to, it's to show you how badly you want something to get over the brick wall to get to it. And you really see, you know, I've always, I've been challenging the whole time for teachers. I think, like, listen, all of you have this sledgehammer to back you. Like you're born as an educator. Like, you got into teaching because you want to, change the world and what you see is on the other side of that brick wall just take your little sledgehammer out and knock down the brick wall and go get what you think needs to be done to help that student just take a risk if you have never done something before do it oh dr ali uh, the videos the videos scare me i don't see like i like watching myself on video camera well get over it you know you have 25 kids that watched you every single day or 150 whatever it is yeah. and we, and we but we said the same get over it. we said Listen, here's what I do. I take one take. If I mess up, I mess up. If my dog comes in my the room and he starts barking, he starts barking. Yeah, he, whatever. But whatever. That's what kids are going through at home. You're yeah. human. The more humanized you make your videos and your online instruction becomes, the more engaging it is for the students and the more real it is for the parents. I love, you know, hearing hearing um you know, uh, my kids, teachers talk sometimes on virtual days and they sound like a human because yeah. the, kids, the tension level goes down. There's that yeah. connection there that we're, hold on. You're not the teacher. I'm the student. You're a person. I'm a person. And we're in this together. Yeah. You know, I've actually really loved the pandemic for this one particular, I mean, no one was the pandemic, but for this one point, And that is even the national news channel, you like, you turn on news, like I never do that anymore. Cause it's too disturbing. Um, is I look at like the fact that a lot of these guests and everyone I meet online, um, unless they're you and you've got like a different background on there. Most, most people is like, that's their house. I feel like I just went to visit them at home. Yeah. You know, like nationally known politicians and people all over, you know, and every educator that I've met, every superintendent, like, Oh, that's what your den looks like at your house. <laughs> I feel like I just came over and we had coffee, you know, it's like, Oh, that was awesome. And so it, it, it made all of America a family to me. Like, well, that person needs to wait, make their bed. What, you know, what's happening? <laughs> uh, that's really, it's like, did your mom and tell you to make your bed? 
Like, okay, so I admit I don't make my bed sometimes too. So, you know, it's fine. But I want to go deeper than that and then, and then invite everyone else who's on the line right now to pop in and like make your odd comments and take us in totally different directions. Totally fine as we have a few more minutes together and then we're going to release you back into the wild and have you have to come back tomorrow. But um, teaching, here's the deal. What is teaching? So I'm really looking at that right now. Like, what is it? Is it lecturing? Because I will tell you with certainty, that's what most teachers think it is. Like that's 99% of the job is prepping for the lecture, right? That's what they think it is. Uh, is it running discipline? Is it making sure you got the right materials? Or is it truly helping you understand at its most, is that's its most atomic level? What is it? And I think, quite frankly, all of America and the world is headed for that conversation, right? What is it when technology can do so much? What is teaching? How do we take humans and use the best quality of humanness? What is it? Because we haven't asked that question, really, on a deep philosophical level yet, I don't think. I've always had a philosophy for years and years and years that every student should graduate high school with a master's degree in learning, really understanding how, how to learn. And yeah. I think about my kids, you know, just, you know, I had this conversation with my son a couple of years ago. He said, I said, son, you need to learn some things in life or not. You need to know some things in life. Like, you need to know who the 16th president is. You need to know this. You need to know. He goes, Dad, I don't need to know any of that stuff. I said, why not? He goes, I'll just ask Google. Google tell me everything. Yeah. And I, said, and I laughed. I said, Google hasn't been around forever. You, there's things you need to know. And he goes, Dad, when was Google invented? I said, I'm not really sure. He goes, okay, Google. When was Google invented? Google has been in 1998. I was like, oh, I didn't know that. And I said, but there's still some things you need to learn in life. Like you need to learn, you know, how to change your bicycle tire if you're out of the house and this and that. He goes, I don't need to learn any of that stuff. I'll just watch YouTube to learn it. And I said, son, you, you can't do that. There's like YouTube's not always going to be around you. He goes, yeah, I have my phone on me. And he, I said, dad, when was YouTube invented? I said, I don't know. He goes, okay, Google, when was YouTube invented? 2005. And he goes, Dad, when was I born? I said, I know that one, 2007. He goes, Dad, YouTube and Google have been around my whole life and probably will be around my whole life. And just like, boom. And, and just, you know, again, like I learned so much from kids because, you know, so two years, three years ago, we started the first artificial intelligence program in the country. And it came about when I'm watching Double Dare with my children and they said, what does AI mean in computer science on Nickelodeon? And my kids on kids on TV are like artificial intelligence. Then I go interview a group of middle school students about what does AI mean? Artific and they could tell me the definition better in graduate students. I'm thinking, holy cow, I'm part of the mixtape generation. They're part of the AI generation. And we're so missing the boat right here because they're not even being taught AI and they're learning it because they're growing up with it on Xbox, YouTube, Netflix, their phones. And we're missing this opportunity gap. And that's what, that's what motivates me because they're learning without us actually teaching, which is part of, like you said, human nature, right? We're going to learn. It's taking that learning and shifting it to what's relevant, meaningful to become community and future ready is our goal. Yeah. And I think the interesting thing in this conversation about motivation and the human role, the teacher role, and your, what your whole conversation with the kids is that they've already observed that they need something to have it right here. Mm -hmm. If they need to know. So the is so what I come back to is the real core principle of what a human does in terms of getting kids to know things so they arrive in life as a decent productive citizen is the instigation of the need to know. Yeah. That is really all it is because otherwise they're not going to ask their phone. Okay? So what prompts them to ask? Their minds have to be facile enough to question and ask questions and see and understand, mm -hmm. right? The bigger pictures. 
So really the human role in terms of motivation is instigation at its root. That's really what humans do. And humans do that fantastically well because we have a herd instinct. We have like, I got to be kind of around other people because, you know, procreation and then, you know, I got to pick up my favorite opposite and blah, blah, blah. And I got to, you know, be seen and have a cool haircut. And, you know, so that's really what humans are trying to do. They want to be togetherness. But right now, if you watch young kids and tell me about your kids, because I've seen this in ours, um, you better be good. Otherwise, you're turned off. Right. Like you're That's literally, right. you're, they switch the channel yeah. on you. Right. They're like, yeah, no, I'm not interested in that. Boom. Right. You better be good. They watch, yeah. You know, they don't watch TV anymore. They watch their favorite YouTube stars. And, you know, I, I think, I think, you know, growing up, it was you're successful based upon what you know. That's what made Jeopardy such a great show. Right. And, you know, who do you, what do you know? Uh, what do you want to become? Can you get there and so forth like that? So we actually, um, you know, we're doing launching a summer program this year and we really flipped the squish and we focused, like you said, all on questions. We have five questions that we do start at the beginning of the summer. And for six weeks, we reflect on these students throughout the summer. And they're at the core of it, it's not what, what do you want to become? What do you know? Anything? The number one question we're asking students right now or learners is who am I? Who are you? You know, let's learn about you first and let's learn about your strengths. What are you good at? What's your passion? What do you like? And the second second question is, who do I want to become? You know, like, who do I want to become? Do I want to become? And I tell, tell my students all the time, I have three goals in my life, to be a great husband, to be a great uh, father, and then uh, do, do what's best I can, to do the best I can every day at the job I work with. Like, those are like three things. Like, notice jobs, three, like husband and father, number one and two. So who do I want to become? And the third question is, how do I get there, right? And that's why we enable education, industry, and community to work together. How do I continue to learn, okay? Not formally, but informally. How do I continue to learn and grow better? And the last question, the most important question is, how do I give back to my community? Those are the questions that we're asking now for, for learners, especially the students as we're trying to prepare them to be successful. It's not, what do you want to become? Do you know what that is? That stuff, you know, the students will have 50 jobs, they say, by the time they're retired. I mean, it's like a free agency out there now. We're seeing it with millennials right now and, and so forth. So, the, the, you know, the, 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 it's not anymore, instead of just, we need to ask more questions. We need to ask the right questions now in order for learners to be successful. Yeah, I totally agree with you. And I, um, this question of the isolation of how you motivate and the role of human leadership in learning, I think is going to be the, the thing you have to look at right now because competition I said earlier, Justin, we're at somewhere as close as 42% of the nation has left the building of traditional public. Mm. They're out. Their charters, private, homeschooling. And that pressure is so enormous on traditional public. It's going to be a tax fight pretty soon. Mm. Um, so what is human teaching and why? Mm. I think we're at that point. And that's going to cause another level to the mountain where we question the curriculum like you have this readiness thing is totally the questioning of are we doing this right are we making them ready right like what's happening and and then and then the role of the human and the perfection of the human interface yeah. like i'm not going to hit help when i'm on a site shopping unless i really need to talk to someone <laughs> right um or i need help or blah 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 blah, blah. uh in the educational experience, the, the like the third biggest technology everybody wanted to look into and purchase when our national survey this year was chatbots and live and and live chat yeah. as a tech that they would put in. Yeah. Um, holy cow! So we're we're getting there, right? Like we're incrementally getting there. But I really think that that perfection of the human, the isolation of the human qualities, yeah, and and then the perfection of the actual curriculum map. And the, the fracturing of that map so it can be individually paced mm. with teachers having the attitude of, I got to SWAT team in and save Johnny. He's lost in fractions, right? Yep. I yep. got to 
you know, pull them out. But then, you know, giving them all the other stuff like you were talking about, like, why are we scaling back? Give the kid esports. He can stay on the esports team as long as he stays up in all of his other subjects. Yeah. Right? Like, come on. Um, uh, well, esports, I mean, we, we built uh, an unbelievable esports arena at our previous school, my, my previous school district. And uh, the reason why we built it is because, you know, it kind of reminds me. So at the, uh, in an ASCD concert uh, in our ASCD conference, I was um, introduced on stage as a futurist. I'm walking on stage. I'm like, what like the who? heck's a futurist? <laughs> you know, well, thinking, you are I don't want to think I know everything, you know? And I was like, moment. So I started thinking of this. I was walking to the podium, getting ready to do this big speech. And, and then um, uh, I said, it dawned on me, like a futurist is someone that listens and supports because they're listening to what people want and they support them. And it kind of reminds me of the Herb Simons quote where, you know, it's not our job to predict the future. It's our job to help uh, envision the future and design the future we want. And so, you know, we had a group of students at Montour that said, hey, we want to have this esports arena, this club. And they told the teacher, the teacher, listen, she supported them. They started getting engaged in. And then she told the principal, the teacher listened and supported. The principal turned, told uh, me in, in central office, we listened and supported. We wrote a grant and we built this beautiful esports arena because the students just didn't want to play games. They said, hey, this is our community, this esports community. This is what bonds us together. We're not, we're going to, this technology is helping us collaborate. It's helping us prepare for our computer science and STEM careers by setting these rooms up, by working through the technology. We'll work together as teams. And they convinced us. And then they said, how much money again did you pay for that football stadium a couple of years ago? And we're like, well, a lot of money. And they said, exactly. And what's that? What's football? What's well, a game? Okay. What's esports? Oh, it's a game. All right, good point. <laughs> you know, so we'll go find you money. But that came about esports, listening and supporting. And so when we even during, during this pandemic, again going back to helping to motivate teachers and students, sometimes we just need to and and just sit back and say, "What do you need? How can we help you?" And then give the resources we need. And and you know, like I said at the beginning. Instead so of teachers ad adopting things, we need to help them adapt to things. And you have to listen and support in order for them to adapt because they're adapting on the fly. And, um, and they're, I, 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 you know, kudos to the teachers and the, and the, and the school districts and the parents. I mean, I mean, just amazing. Wow, I know. We, we can't stop praising people enough for this stuff. Just a lot of work's going into it. And, um, you know, a lot of good things. And I'm, I'm just so glad that things seem like in certain areas, you know, they're getting better. Um, I, I hope and I, I pray that they're getting better every day. And, but, it, you know, we just have to keep a positive mindset. And that's the biggest thing is keep a positive mindset. And, 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 and hopefully this conversation switches from teachers to student, from learner to learner, um, from, you know, getting a good job to being community ready. I mean, that's, to me, that's our biggest thing. Yeah. I'm thinking about everything you said. I think, yeah, we have a question. I here. think we have a big, I think we have a, yeah, I want to get to that in a second and have Gus jump on. Um, Doug, if you can unmute Gus so he can jump on in a second, but you know, I just want to make this comment about everything you were just saying, which is uh, we're moving from something done to the student, like teaching is, and subject distribution and class distribution is something we're doing to students. It's like the attitude is we're going to run this manufacturing line and roll people and we're going to do stuff to them, right? Like they're going to do, you know, versus four. The attitude shift is now that you're digital, what can you do for, right? Because you can just load up stuff, load another app for Johnny, load another app for, you know, you know, Pavon or whatever, you know, like here she is and she's going to do blah, blah, blah. Right. Um, just, router into the you know so it's a different network based mental mindset and, it, and it's a very interesting um twist where we're really going it isn't just we automated stuff no we've arrived in a new universe and we're just barely on the first planet yeah. um okay so um gus uh yeah. Are you, yeah go ahead great question gus um you know uh 
I've been listening to, uh, especially you in the last hour, um, and it's very all very thought provoking. But you know, in for lack of a better term, in the real world, um, there are children that do not necessarily have the proper motivation, or they don't have the necessary support at home, or there are other issues with them. What happens to them in a digital world? Uh, hey, Gus, I, I, the school district, I just, we were a Title I elementary school. Um, you know, we obviously, you know, we had students that didn't have the same support levels, I would say. I would, I would never say they didn't have any support, but they, you know, there, there were support levels that, you know, you know, it could be viewed in different ways, but, um, you know, it, it's really, again, I, I think it comes down to structuring the uh, leadership and the resources within your school district. I think that's probably the biggest thing we had to scramble with was, okay, what's the role of a guidance counselor now? What's the role of a nurse? What's the role of a, a social worker, a psychologist, uh, what's the role of, of uh, the front office staff? Okay, not just the teachers had to shift, but as a whole school community, we had to shift and rethink those roles. And so the students that were not getting a proper support at home, you know, I, I can tell you right now, I would get in my truck and I would drive to these houses and I would call it like, hey, did you, do you need anything? We, we saw you weren't online today. Oh yeah, or, or something didn't happen. We didn't have this. Okay, can I get you those things? And those are things that, you know, I talked about the brick wall, um, you know, stopping us. It's, it, it took a whole team effort to really sit down and say, yeah, 95% of our students may be doing this and that, but what about these five students? And what are we intentionally doing as a, as a system, not as an individual relationships? This is, this could, this is like a whole session <laughs> right here. It's, <laughs> It's building systems on the fly that are intentional to meet the needs of those students. Just like, you know, if we want are going virtual to all in person for the first time in history, it'll be completely d different again, right? We have to redesign our system to meet those needs. So we're, we have to redesign how we do things and shift priorities and job responsibilities. And that's very hard to some people. And, um, you know, teachers as well, you know, we had to, you know, mix it up where we had, you know, teachers teaching all remote, teachers teaching all in person, teachers teaching all in virtual or teachers that are doing a little bit of both. And um, what's that look like? And what's, you know, what's your role look like right now? And asking hard questions. And, you know, some people are okay with it. Some people are uncomfortable with it. But in the world world, um, yes, it is. It, the systems blew up, not just teaching, but all the support systems also blew up and it had to be very intentional design, unfortunately, from top down in a lot of cases, because the this, this system had to support and not certain individuals within the system, because you're going to, that's where you have the cracks, right, uh, to fall in place. So it really takes a whole new strategic initiative planning session on the fly to support those students. And I've seen it firsthand, um, you know, a lot of people step up individuals, but it needed some clear direction and system support in order to make it effective at all. Good, good comment and nice question. Thank you. Yeah, and I, I completely agree with the question overall. And I, and in my mind, just looking at the research data, my concern is that we are subsumed in our human bureaucracy with the bureaucracy itself and the structure rather than the service model and seeing every individual student as an individual. Mm -hmm. You know, like this kid is 50 miles from nowhere and they don't have any home support and the heat's not on. Um, what do we do? <laughs> right? Because the usual is not going to work. So we're not well, going to go while well, they didn't show up. I, I will say that, yeah. uh, that this pandemic, I think, has sort of been a blessing in disguise in that it has forced us to change radically the way we look at how we educate our children. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
Yeah, I love it. You know, I think this is cool as a thing. <laughs> I don't agree with you anymore. And Gus, something I said way earlier too, when school districts really struggle to shift, it's because they're saying, oh my goodness, I can't believe we have to go virtual. Uh, we better start ordering computers. We better start teaching students how to work online. We better start doing this. I almost want to say in some regards, and I know there's funding formulas and stuff like that, but um, almost like shame on you because <laughs> it's 2021 and you should have been doing this stuff already and or saying, oh my goodness, how are we going to support these kids um, cause when we couldn't even support them in, in person? Well, again, it's kind of like, you know, like I said, the curtains pulled back now. Like you can't, kids can't come in a building and, you know, we're, we're, the grass is cut nice and neat. It's quiet. You know, it's, it's going well. Well, the learning's exposed. The support levels are exposed now. And the school districts that were preparing for the unknown, the pandemic, are the ones that we're kind of saying, okay, we know we're not mandated to do this, but we know it's in the best interest of kids, so we're going to do it. And that's where you see this, to me, that's where you see the equity gap happening right now. And unfortunately, unfortunately, it's getting wider and wider and wider. And and I'd say to say this, but that's one of the reasons why, you know, I'm able to, you know, with, with the support from a great foundation and university to step out and say, okay, I'm going to take on this role and, uh, and try to help as best I can uh, because I see it. I see it right now, the equity gaps happening more and more. And, uh, and, I, and I want to do something about it. And, and, um, and I have a great support system around me to, to you know, make those efforts come true, hopefully. Good. Well, excellent comment. Thank you, Gus. Thank you. Um, and thank you, uh, Justin. So good to see you again. You too. Um, thank you. Yeah, it's good. This has been a good, really good conversation. So I'm going to wrap up here. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Justin. Thank you. Everyone else who's online right now. See you tomorrow. Bye for now. The future of work is changing. Now students are expected to graduate with a foundation in digital literacy and computer science so they can use technology, create digital artifacts, and design solutions to some of the world's biggest challenges. With Learning.com's award-winning technology curriculum, EasyTech, you and your team of educators ensure that all students are prepared for a career in computer science. Through EasyTech's scaffolded curriculum, you promote digital equity by closing the digital skills gap and giving all students access to authentic learning using technology. The content areas develop students' digital skills like keyboarding and computer fundamentals, build their proficiency in word processing, presentation, spreadsheet, and multimedia tools, and enable them to practice critical thinking and problem solving with computational thinking and design real-world solutions with coding. Across these content areas, students have hands-on and collaborative practice using digital tools and skills that are the foundation to successful technology integration in the classroom. Developed by educators like you, EasyTech has an ISTE seal of alignment and is aligned to national and state-level computer science, digital literacy, and technology standards. Your EasyTech subscription gains you access to its comprehensive curriculum, which features elements like digital lesson plans with an interactive interface that individualize learning based on student performance, hands-on and collaborative projects in which students create original digital artifacts using real software programs, pre- and post-grade level tests designed to measure student growth, and discussion opportunities and other formative check-ins. The program saves teachers time with detailed scope and sequences, pre-built pacing calendars, and digital lesson plans. EasyTech helps your team ensure technology integration in the classroom is student-led, purposeful, and effective with adaptive content and gamified lessons that provide immediate feedback to students. EasyTech is designed for a simple implementation that enables your team to feel comfortable teaching technology even if they don't have prior experience. And with EasyTech's in-depth year-over-year reporting at the individual, classroom, school, and district level, your work is rooted in efficacy.